Howdy everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger, mathematician turned banker. Today we're going to talk about money in a very broad kind of way. We're going to talk about coin, cash, and credit, and then move on to explaining how fractional reserve banking really works. And I'll illustrate all of that with a cool story about Slim and his hundred dollars that he brought into Little Cactus just when I was about starting my bank. Okay, so in the story of money, there's three broad categories that are convenient. Coin, cash, and credit, we'll say, because they all start with C. Now, coin for us means metal, gold, silver prominently, but in history, also copper and iron played a role. Another name for coin is specie. Okay, that's just another name for coin. So these don't actually have to be coins, they just have to be metals that we can weigh, that we can feel, that we can put in our pocket. In some sense, back in our day, when I started out, this was the primary source of money for sure. Okay, this is what money really was, and the other ones were kind of variants or somehow related to this core aspect of money. Then we have cash, okay, which is banknotes, and also, I guess, small change too, but mostly banknotes. And then we have the third category, which is a lot harder to get one's head around, which is credit, which consists of all kinds of things, including checks, bills of exchange, credit accounts, mortgages, securities, bonds, and many others. So this is a big can of worms trying to get our head around credit. Nevertheless, broadly, these are sort of three major aspects of money. And the usual story that you learn about in economics courses is that there's a kind of progression here. The progression probably starts before our time in earlier civilizations, which supposedly were based on barter, where I exchange my three goats for your cow or something like that. And then gradually we move somehow to using metals coin, in other words, for a medium of exchange. And then much later, eventually cash is introduced, and then in modern times, credit plays a more and more important role. So this is the standard story, but it's almost surely quite wrong, okay? Surely quite wrong, and it has in fact been mostly discredited, but probably the economics books still uh, more or less rely on this story. So we'll have to talk uh, more about that as we proceed. Now, when I started my banking career out in Little Cactus around 1850, gold and silver were definitely primary. They were the main forms of money, and everything else was somehow related to either gold or silver. At that time, the Spanish dollar was probably the paramount international currency. It was a silver dollar, sometimes called a piece of eight because it was consisting of eight reals. And this was in wide use around the world, including uh, in, in Western countries where we are. And it was supposed to be 387 grains of silver, so it was pegged to silver. Another important coin around that time was the American Eagle, which was a $10 coin made of gold. There were also banknotes, and there were many of them because they were often issued by individual banks, along with some government notes as well. But in all of these cases, or in almost all of these cases, they were typically backed by coin. In other words, backed by gold and silver. So on the bank note, there was a little statement that guaranteed that you could go into the bank and give them your $10, $10 note, and they would give you $10 of gold or silver in exchange. That was the deal. That was what a bank note promised. Okay, so the force of the bank note rested directly on the authority of gold and silver and the value that those intrinsically had. At the time, there were also specialized credit instruments, much fewer than we have today. But we definitely did have bonds and they played a specialized role. And we'll be talking a lot more about bonds later on. Now, classical textbooks teach us that there are three primary functions of money. The first is as a medium of exchange. So we can exchange things smoothly. The other one is a unit of account so that we know how much things are worth and that we have some value associated to our, our money. And the other is a store of value so that when I've made some money, I can 
find a place where I can store it safely and uh, with a long-term view in mind. Now, gold and silver, as I said, were the main forms of money at the time that I was a banker and for thousands of years before that. So they've been valued since at least 4000 BC, primarily for jewelry, but also for religious items, in rituals, eating utensils, of course, made out of silver. And in modern times, lots of industrial applications, electronics, dentistry, alloys, batteries, and many other things. And in fact, silver is especially important in industry. So there's lots of reasons why these two metals have been traditionally valued. First of all, they are durable. They don't decay, they don't rot, they don't disfigure with time. They're very durable. They are divisible, so you can divide them up. You can melt them down, you can figure them into different patterns, you can put them in bars, you can put them in coins. So um, they are very flexible that way. They're unreactive, they don't tarnish if you bring them in contact with other things, generally speaking, so they're, they're very uh, solid that way. And of course they're portable, gold especially, because it's much lighter for the same value as silver is. So you can put a lot of value in your back pocket with gold or even silver. Now because we have these two metals which are more or less on par in terms of a form of exchange, the ratio or the relative values of them is very important, has been historically very important, and surprisingly has varied quite a lot in history. Our earliest record of the actual explicit relationship between these two metals is found in ancient Egypt, even before the pyramids were built, in the time of Menes, who unified Upper and Lower Egypt. In one of the records associated to his time, it's referenced that one unit of gold, when I say unit I mean some weight of gold, is equal to two and a half units of silver. That was historically uh, relatively low. So in Mesopotamia, in the old Babylonian period, around 2000 BC, time of Hammurabi, it was one to six. One ounce of gold was worth six ounces of silver. By the time we got to Greece, time of Plato, it was one to twelve. Then in Rome, around Julius Caesar, one to seven and a half is explicitly mentioned. In medieval Europe, it was higher. It was ranging from around one to 10 to one to 12. And then gradually it sort of eased upwards. So by the time we came around to my time, 1850 to around 1870, it was one to 15. In fact, it was pegged in America as uh, this ratio for quite a long time. But then after this period, it gradually drifted upwards to one to 17. In modern times, uh, things have changed dramatically. So, although there has been a shift, relatively slow shift in these uh, numbers over time, there has been relative stability in this, uh, in this ratio, but in modern times, much less so. So, in the last 50 years or so, the ratio has gone from 1 to 40 to pretty well 1 to 100. In fact, these days, it's pretty close to 1 to 100. So, by historical standards, Gold is much overvalued currently, and silver is very much undervalued. Now, what about the banknote side of things? So that was definitely secondary, although there were a lot of advantages to banknotes. Namely, they were easier to carry. You didn't have to be constantly weighing them to assess their value. And they were less susceptible in some ways to tampering with. So with the, the metals, you can maybe try to dilute them by putting in some extra stuff in there, or you can shave off little bits of coins and so on. So there was always some kind of tampering possible there, and banknotes are a little bit less um, prone to that, although there's a question of counterfeit uh, there, which is an issue. So anyway, around 1850 to about 1910, banknotes were pretty well redeemable in specie. So at least officially, you could go to the bank and collect your gold or silver for your banknotes, and that's what gave the banknotes ultimately their value. But there were some exceptions uh, to this. For example, the greenback introduced by Lincoln uh, during or after the war, uh, the Civil War, that uh, was a little bit different. So anyway, what, um, what's the history there of banknotes? Well, it goes back quite a long ways, but no, nowhere near as long as the gold and silver story. So actual coins, physical coins, were first minted around uh, 600 BC in Lydia, 
present-day Turkey. And banknotes themselves were uh, in usage by the Chinese, for example, in the times of Genghis Khan, the Mongol times. Now, if we fast forward, uh, a big shift in modern times comes about slowly uh, in the Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt prohibited the ownership of gold. So the, the connection between gold and banknotes started to be diminished. You were not officially allowed to actually own gold. And then a few decades later, Nixon in 1971 officially abandoned the gold standard so that it was no longer even t remotely or technically feasible to exchange your banknotes for gold or silver. And this was very momentous uh, development in the, the history of the modern financial world and had all kinds of repercussions, as we'll be talking about uh, at some later point. So at this stage then, the role of banknotes becomes quite different. Okay, it's now called fiat money, which means that it's ultimately supported by belief or trust rather than by association to explicit commodities or physical quantities. That's a very big difference and does open the door to much wider swings or manipulations of currencies, which in fact has uh, been a major feature of modern financial life since, uh, since the time of the disassociation from the gold standard. Okay, so we've made some initial contact with this important story of the kinds of money historically. So now let me go back to 1850 when I opened up my bank and I want to explain to you the, the role of fractional reserve banking, which is the standard kind of model for how banks work. And I want to explain to you that there's something happening with this model, which in fact is a little bit independent of whether we're working with specie or with banknotes or even with credit. Okay, so the basic idea is, is very naive and it's popularly believed. The idea that banks essentially take deposits, they keep a fraction of those deposits, and then they loan out the rest. So this is the standard view that most people will have about the business model of a bank. Here is a bank. It happens to be the Little Cactus Bank, my bank. And here is a depositor. The depositor comes with, say, P dollars and deposits these P dollars in my bank. So what happens? Well. I take a proportion of that, a fraction of that. And let's call this fraction R, R for reserve fraction. So that's the fraction of the deposit that I'm going to put in my reserves, in my vault or my safe. So that's R times P, that's going into my vault. I'll picture it like this, okay? At the time, actually, I didn't have a vault. Later on, I did. Uh, but at that time, I just had a safe. But we'll imagine it right down there. It's underground. It's safe. So we're putting a fraction of that deposit into our vault. That's R times P. And the rest of it, the difference between what he's deposited and what we've kept, that's 1 minus R times P. That we are going to loan out to somebody else. So somebody else is going to come. We're going to lend him this money. He or she is going to go off and buy something or pay someone for something. Okay, now when I started my bank, I was very conservative, as I've told you before. I wanted to be really safe, so I said, okay, let's use a reserve fraction of 0.2. So that's the same as the fraction one-fifth. That means I kept one-fifth of all deposits, more or less, in my bank. And that's a very hefty reserve fraction. So almost no modern bank is going to get anywhere near close to that. But anyway, that's what I did. And it worked uh, reasonably well at first, even though it was kind of a modest way of making money. Modest but safe. Now, very shortly after I set up my bank, I had an interesting depositor come. His name was Slim. He was actually from Big City, which is uh, the big city pretty close to where we are, a couple of days down the river. And he had been an undertaker there for all his career, and he decided he'd had enough of Big City life, and he wanted to set up his smaller shop in Little Cactus. And so he came, and he uh, walked into my uh, office. We had a chat with him. He, he was 
indeed a very thin guy, thin, thinnest guy I've ever seen. In any case, he had $100 that he wanted to deposit with me. And it was interesting because he had $101 bills of this newly minted banknote that the big city bank had just put out. Now, I had known about these banknotes because, in fact, the manager had sent me some copies. Because the manager wanted me to make sure that the townsfolk of Little Cactus were familiar and happy and trusting of this new-looking currency. It looked actually quite good. I wish I had some still around. Probably worth quite a lot of money now. But anyway, Slim had a hundred of these $1 bills and nobody else except for me in the town had seen these before. So I thought, okay, this is great. This allows me to make a little experiment. Because I was kind of interested in how money circulates. Okay, so I thought to myself, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this hundred dollars and I'm going to sort of put it through my machine. I'm gonna lend it out at every opportunity. And because these dollar bills were so identifiable, I'll be able to track to see what happens to them. So kind of a little bit of an experiment. So that's exactly what I did. I said, thanks, Slim, I'll take your money. So we start with a principle of a hundred. We're calling it P. Okay, and I remind you that my reserve fraction is R, which is 0.2. But instead of working with the actual numbers, can we be a little bit abstract? Just a little bit of mathematics, okay? So I'm going to use P and R instead of 100 and 0.2 because it allows me to see more clearly what's really going on. Okay, so you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so Slim comes, he deposits P dollars with me. Now, P is 100, but forget about 100, it's just P for now. So what happens to this $100? Well, I'm going to put R times P, that's the fraction that I'm going to put in my reserves, into my vault. And I'm going to loan out 1 minus RP, in other words, the remainder, to the public. Someone's going to come in, ask them for a loan, and I'm going to pay them the loan with these brand new $1 bills from Big City Bank. Okay, now what's going to happen to this money that I lend out to somebody or maybe to several people? It doesn't matter. Well, that money is going to go out into the community and whoever is taking out the loan will use it for something. Maybe they're buying a piano or a new pair of rifles or maybe some stock for their farm or a new, new fencing, something or other. They're going to buy it. And whoever is selling them that stuff, whoever who's providing the service is going to get that 1 minus RP dollars. Since I'm the only bank in town, there's a good chance that that will come back to me. That person will show up and want to deposit that money with me. So, let's suppose that that's what happens. So, whoever takes this money eventually, brings it back and deposits it. So, there is the second deposit that we're looking at. It's a new deposit, but it's really the same cash. They look still like these big city $1 bills, that's what we've got talking about. But now there's 1 minus R times P of them. What am I going to do with this new deposit? Well, I'm going to put R times it into my vault. That's the fraction that I keep. And the remainder, what is the remainder? The remainder is this thing times 1 minus R. Just as the remainder here was this thing times 1 minus R. So the remainder that I'm going to lend out now is 1 minus R squared times P. So somebody else comes in and I lend them that money and they go off and buy something. And then whoever is paid, hopefully they come back and make a third deposit with my bank. So now I'm looking at 1 minus R squared times P being deposited once again. And you can see that there's a pattern here that self-evidently keeps going. I'm going to take R times this and stick it in my vault. I'm going to multiply this by 1 minus R to get 1 minus R cubed P, and I'm going to lend this out again. So there's a nice pattern here. We can see very clearly what's happening. And what we're especially interested in is sort of the totals. How much do I end up with in my vault? And how much do I end up lending out altogether? Now, mind you, this is all from Slim's original P dollars, which happens to be 100. Now, I need to remind you a little bit about geometric series. Okay, that's the kind of mathematics that every banker needs to know. Here is the fundamental formula. What you get when you add one 
plus r plus r squared plus r cubed all the way up to some r to the n. n is a natural number. And the answer is you get 1 minus r to the n plus 1 divided by 1 minus r. And why is this true? Well, it's true because if you take the denominator here, multiply both sides by the denominator, you got this thing here times 1 minus r. And when you expand that out, you see that most of the terms cancel, positive and negative. And the only ones left over are what's on the right-hand side, the 1 minus r to the n plus 1. Okay, so now from this, we can make a little deduction that if our ratio r is between 0 and and 1, and in our case, that's going to be the case because we're talking about fractions and so on. So in that case, what happens to this quantity as n gets big? n is a natural number, so it's getting big, maybe 10, 20, 100, 1,000, and so on. What happens to that? Well, this term here, because it's some number between 0 and 1, raised to a big power, becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, like 0.2. 0.2 to the 10, that's pretty small. 0.2 to the 100, that's really small, etc. So this right-hand side approaches just 1 over 1 minus r. That's the statement here. So that this sum, as you crank up n, approaches 1 over 1 minus r. Now my fellow pure mathematicians like to cheat a little bit here, and they like to make statements by replacing this thing with equals, and they have these limit notions, They're talking about the limit of this equals this, it doesn't really work, okay? Um, but, you know, that's the language they like to use. But it's really safer to be explicit and be sort of honest about what's really going on here. We're not doing an infinite number of things, okay? We're just talking about what happens is as this thing gets big, what does this thing move towards? Okay, so this arrow is quite a useful and reasonable thing to do. Okay, so when we modify this just a little bit, if we multiply everything by a, then we get sort of a more general formula, a plus a times r plus a times r squared, and so on, all the way up to a times r to the n. That approaches a divided by 1 minus r as n gets big. So now if we come back to this little diagram, we see that the geometric series are appearing right here and here, okay? Because the sum here of all these deposits, rp and then r times 1 minus rp and then r times 1 minus r squared p, is exactly such a geometric series that starts with r times p, and the common ratio, what you need to multiply this by to get this, or this by to get this, is 1 minus r. Okay. And over here, it's similar, except that now we're starting with 1 minus r times p. And at each stage, we're multiplying again by 1 minus r. Not r, 1 minus r. Okay. So we have two geometric series here, essentially. And so we can see what happens to those as the number of steps starts getting large. So now we're able to draw some really important conclusions, which are maybe not entirely intuitive. So the first is to look at the total in the vault. Every time there's a deposit, I take a fraction of it, I put it in my vault. How much am I going to get all together as a result of all these subsequent deposits? Well, we're summing rp, that was the first one, and then r times 1 minus rp, and then r times 1 minus r squared p, and so on. Okay, And that's going to move towards... What was our formula? It was the first term, which is r times p, divided by 1 minus the ratio. And what is the ratio? Going from here to here? From here to here? It's 1 minus r. So we have to divide by 1 minus 1 minus r. That makes the denominator r, which cancels with that r, and the total is p. That means that as time goes on and I keep taking deposits and lending more money out, eventually all those hundred one dollar bills are going to be in my vault. Maybe we have to wait for some time and there's a question of divisibility because obviously we can't keep dividing and dividing forever, but basically all the initial deposit ends up in my vault. All 100 of those $1 bills that Slim originally deposited. 
Now, what about the total amount of loans that I've loaned out? Well, the first fellow got 1 minus r times p, the next one got 1 minus r squared times p, and then 1 minus r cubed times p. So that's another geometric series. The first term is 1 minus r times p. The common ratio is again 1 minus r. So we get 1 minus r divided by r times p, which we could write if we want to as 1 over r minus 1 times p. So, in my case, r was 0 0.2, or 1 -fifth. That was my reserve ratio, or reserve fraction. So then, this 1 over r becomes 5, and the 5 minus 1 becomes 4. Okay, so the total amount that I end up loaning out is 4 times p. p was $100, means I've lent out, at the end of the day, or after we wait long enough, I've lent out $400. So what is the final story at the end of this little experiment? Slim has come with his $100. He's deposited his $100 into my bank for safekeeping and to make his 5% interest a year. But out of that, I have managed to create this kind of remarkable situation. And I want to emphasize okay, that this is before it twigged in my mind that I should be thinking about credit, that I should be thinking about you know, creating entries on my balance sheet, one on this side and one on this side, to balance. This was before all of that. This was when I was just starting out doing the simple, naive thing that banks are supposed to do. Okay, So there's no checks involved here, there's no credit accounts, we're just talking about cash. Cash being moved around. And the result is, Slim's $100 in cash is right here in my vault. Count it, there's 100 $1 bills from the big city bank. They're all in my vault. But what else has happened? Well, I've loaned out a total of $400 to various individuals in the community. Now, I'm going to represent it this way with four, so you can remember four, okay? But it could be like one person, or it could be, you know, a hundred people, whatever. But these are the people that I have lent these monies out. And the total amount that they owe, like the total amount, is $400. These guys in total owe the bank $400. What else has happened is that I've also generated money to other members of the community. So altogether, the $400 that these guys have owed ended up going to some other guys, okay? And these guys, they received the monies from these people in, in, in as payment for some, some services perhaps, or some, some equipment or whatever, and they came and deposited the money also with me. Okay, so remember, I, I only got $20 of Slim's original money. The other contributions to this 100 came from these other people. So there's four other people who also have, effectively, contributed $100 each to my bank in total. Okay, so we'll represent that totally. So there's a kind of a balance here. The end result is that there's $100 sitting in my account. Slim knows that he has deposited $100. There's also four individuals total that owe me $400, and there's another four individuals that effectively I owe $400 to. But they don't think about it that way. They think that they've got deposits in my bank of $100, because they've actually deposited physical monies in my bank. Right? The monies that they have had are in my bank for safekeeping. But if you look at the situation, well, there's only $100. If these five worthy people all wanted their money back at the same time, I would be out of luck, and they would be out of luck too, because there's only $100 to go around for all five of them. So Slim's $100 has thus generated, by the activities of the bank, doing nothing shady, nothing other than the naive thing that banks are supposed to do, has generated $500 of credit in the community, in the public. And that's visible. Right? These guys know that they have that money in their banks, and they can show you their bank books that certify that. But it's also generated $400 worth of debt. That's more hidden. It's also in the public, but it's hidden, because these guys are not going to go around and 
you know, advertise the fact that, well, I've got a new piano, but actually I don't own it. Uh, the bank does because I owe the money to the bank, right? They're not going to say that. So if you just came and looked at Little Cactus at the end of this story, you'd say, look, things have been generating here. These, these people have got pianos and rifles and new stock. And these people have got, um, they've got a lot more bank money in their, in their accounts, you know? So this has all happened, but it's all happened just as a result of Slim's original $100 and the magic machinations that the existence of a bank brings to a community. It's a form of magic. And an important uh, kind of consequence of this, which I should have twigged to if I had done this analysis in, uh, in that time, which I should have, I kind of knew this, but I didn't think about it clearly enough. I didn't think about it as a mathematician. If I had thought about it as a mathematician and said, well, what's really going on here? I could have drawn the following conclusion. I could have said, well, look, Slim has come with his $100, and then I have generated these loans. What I could have done is I could have bypassed that entire story. I could have just said, thanks very much, Slim. We'll put your $100 in my vault, and then not touched, not touched it and then just created loans and corresponding credit accounts for these other, say, four people here and four people here. Right? So I could actually have circumvented this entire somewhat laborious process of giving people monies and then having it returned again, and just cut straight to the chase and just take Slim's deposits and put it there. This is more or less what happens when you put money in your bank. If you actually go to your bank with $100, that's what's going to happen. They're going to take your $100 and they're going to put it right in the vault. They're not going to lend out that money. Well, I mean, they might, but that's not essentially what they do. Essentially, the money just goes in the vault and then that money sitting there supports this loan generating activity that they, that they create. So the more people they have putting money in their vaults, the more of this loan stuff they can create, and that's where the business is made for the bank. So it's a, a kind of a happy situation at some level, but on the other hand, it's precarious, right? Because we have the situation where all of these five worthy individuals think that they have, they know that they have $100 each deposited in my bank, but actually there's really only $100 to share between them. It's like a kind of financial musical chairs. In our next video, we want to talk about what happened in 1873. So major calamity struck widely around the world and a long depression ensued and there was a major silver collapse and that affected the Smith brothers uh, importantly and changed the direction of my bank completely 180 degrees. Tell you all about that in my next video. I'm Norman Walberger. Thanks for listening.